I've always been a storyteller. It's all I've ever wanted to do. You know, I'm a big geek, so you know, I've been reading comic books since before I can remember. After I graduated college, I went to work for DC Comics in New York as an editorial assistant, which is a fancy title that basically means Xerox boy, and worked my way up to associate editor. Eventually became director of series development at Walt Disney Television Animation. We started making Gargoyles, and I just fell in love with that show. Most recently, uh, I did Young Justice for Warner Brothers and DC and Cartoon Network. It's been a blessed career in that sense, just had some great properties to work on and some great people to work with, and that's just been a blast, and sort of continuing now with Star Wars Rebels. You know, we have with us today Mr. Greg Wiseman, who, when I was growing up, when I was a kid, I should say, there was four animation creators and writers that I actually knew about. I knew Akira Toriyama, because of Dragon Ball Z. I knew Bruce Tim because he's Bruce Tim. I knew Gendy Tartakowski, and I knew you, Mr. Wiseman. I, I, I knew you and your shows and your writing, and uh, you know, you've know been involved with uh, well, Starship Troopers, Men in Black, Gargoyles, a lot of stuff which I grew up, grew up watching. So we're going to start, I guess, with Gargoyles, because that's where I know you first from, and that was one of your earliest projects that a lot of people really, really know. So I, I read... Uh, when I had the DVDs and so on for Gargoyles, that originally the show was supposed to be a comedy, and you had, you had a, created it to be a comedy adventure. What transformed it to be a comedy adventure to the more dramatic and a lot darker Disney adventure that we got? Uh, well, the short answer to that is that uh, we pitched it to Michael Eisner, who at the time was you know, chairman of the Walt Disney Company and chose all the shows. And we pitched the comedy adventure version to Michael, uh, and he didn't like it. <laughs> so, you know, he passed on it. And, um, and you know, the advantage of the mogul system, which and Michael Eisner was pretty much the last of the moguls, um, is that, you know, there's no court of appeal there. If, if Michael doesn't like it, it doesn't go. Good news is, is that if Michael does like it, and back in those days, if Michael Eisner, head of the Walt Disney Company, says, Let's make this, and everybody else in the company either gets on board or gets out of the way. Um, and that's what's different. You know, nowadays those decisions are made by committee at a much lower level, but you have to convince, you know, 20 people, and any one of them can derail a project. Uh, whereas back in the day, if Michael said go, we went. So with Gargoyles, he passed on the comedy version. We went back to the drawing board because we still like the concept. Um, and uh, I showed it to a number of people who hadn't seen the pitch just to get some feedback, some advice. In particular, I uh, showed it to a guy named Tad Stone, the creator of Duckling Duck. And Tad suggested that we had all these little, cute, comedic gargoyles. He said, what if you had one big, you know, gargoyle instead? And he referenced Beauty and the Beast, which uh, I don't know if you realize was a little movie Disney had back then that did pretty well for them. <laughs> just a little, just a little. And, uh, you know, so it was something that Michael would know and get. And, and we already had our sort of female human friend of the gargoyles in the show. Um, and so we created Goliath. I, uh, Greg Guler and I created Goliath. Greg created him visually, and I came up with the character, and... We took the whole concept and every other character in the show and sort of put them through the, all these comedic characters through the prism of Goliath and came out the other end fundamentally with the show that you all know and love. Um, and we created this huge elaborate pitch with all these characters and all these concepts. Uh, and six months later, we went in front of Michael Eisner and we pitched it to him. This big drama show with all this stuff. And he passed again. Um, and uh, But Jeffrey Katzenberg asked us to work on it some more. Uh, and we looked at the pitch, and we were like, okay, what do we want to change about the show? And we decided, well, we love the show. We don't want to change anything about the show. The problem isn't the show. The problem is the pitch itself. It's too complicated. There's too much in the kitchen sink. 
all good stuff, all stuff that we eventually did put in the show, like the mutates and the pack and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but stuff that was distracting in the pitch itself. So we just cut stuff out of the pitch and really focused on that Beauty and the Beast relationship between Goliath and Elisa. And we pitched it a third time to Eisner, and this time he liked it. And again, he said, go. Everyone got on board or got out of the way, and we made a show. And again, all that stuff that was in the second pitch went back into the show. It just didn't belong in the pitch. And if you want to see that pitch, the one that sold it, you can see it on uh, the season one DVD. It's one of the extras on the season one DVD. Back in that day, Big Disney's main shows were like DuckTales, Chip and Dale, Tailspin, Darkwing Duck, and so on. Was it originally supposed to be a comedy like in the vein of those ones where, you know, like DuckTales were it's adventurous, but they have a lot of... inspired by Gummy Bears. Oh. It was I didn't that, yeah. Gummy Bears, which had all these cute little multicolored bears. And so the yeah, I used to watch that in the morning. Was, uh, you know, us sort of looking at Jim Magon's Gummy Bears show and saying, okay, what can we do to do a show like this with this great, rich, medieval backstory? But uh, honestly, you know, Gummy Bears didn't get a lot of respect. I think mostly because there was confusion with another show on at the time called Care Bears. Um, And so we, you know, A, decided, okay, we're going to set this in the modern world. Gummy Bears was set in medieval times. We're going to set it in the modern world, and our characters would be medieval characters who were asleep for a thousand years under a spell, and they'd wake up in the modern world, so it had a little more edge to it. And in the 90s, the word edge was really big. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then the second thing was is that instead of being cute little bears, they would be cute little gargoyles. So again, a little more edge to it. They're little monsters. They're good guys, but they're the monsters also. And so, but otherwise it was very much in the vein of Gummy Bears with its own backstory, its own mythology, all the things that Gummy Bears had. Um, We tried to do, not copy them, but have that kind of feel, that kind of richness to the show. I was a huge fan of Gummy Bears, of Jim Magon's Gummy Bears, and I just thought, I want to do something like that. And so we did. And again, a lot of that stuff from the comedy development survives in the modern show that people saw. Um, it just, instead of playing it for laughs, we played it for, you know, for, well, sometimes for laughs, but we also played it for, you know, pathos and drama and humor and romance and all sorts of stuff. But it was all, a lot of it was present, even in the very original development. Gargoyle started off in a very rather dark note as far as kids television goes in the, in the 90s you know the first i think four episode arc is a very is a very dark one you introduce a ton of characters and by the end of it well there's not so many characters anymore um was well, the reception to the initial well a lot of them I mean, got smashed not true i mean none of the characters we introduced died um, no, so I just meant like the smashed in Scotland things. A, a lot of uh, right, and the ones that got smashed were not a single one of the ones that got smashed in Scotland in the first episode uh, were characters we had introduced. Um, I mean, literally zero. And in fact, I always thought that was cheating. Now, after the fact, we introduced a couple characters in flashback who got smashed and that were re- resurrected as the characters Cold Stone, Cold Fire, and Cold Steel, but. Um, that was very much cheating. We never introduced those characters in the first episode. Um, and, in fact, none of the characters who got smashed, and by the way, you didn't see any of the smashing on screen. No. Um, you heard it, but you didn't see it. Uh, and none of the ones that got smashed were characters you had seen. So I, I was just wondering, so the, was the reception from the, the – since this show was, at least as I recall – different from a lot of what Disney was doing at that time beyond, you know, we got Hunchback a little while later and a bunch of the darker animated movies. Was the reception early on uh, po- really positive or was it, it sort was of mixed and it was positive, different? And we were nervous about it, but it was very positive um, right from the beginning. You know, we showed a preview. We had an event, a press event, um, and we uh, at Universal, uh, Universal City, at the Universal Sheridan, um, 
and uh, I was there, and my boss, Gary Kreisel, and three of the actors from the show, uh, Jonathan Frakes, uh, Edward Asner, and uh, Bill Feigerbach, who played respectively David Xanatos, um, Hudson the Gargoyle, and Broadway the Gargoyle. And um, we showed just this clip. We didn't even have a full episode back yet, but we showed this clip, which is very dramatic and very impressive, with very, and we had just enormous speakers. So we had the music playing extremely loud. It wasn't even the music from the show because we didn't have that yet. So it was borrowed music over the little bit of animation that we had. So to some extent, the whole thing was smoke and mirrors. But it was just enough to get a flavor of the show. And when it was over, and this was short, like a two-minute clip, I still got it somewhere. Um, there is silence in the room. I mean, silence. And they're all reporters. There's no, uh, you know, this wasn't kids. This wasn't families. This wasn't parents per se, although I'm sure some of the reporters were parents. In fact, I know they were. Um, but they were there as reporters, not as parents in theory. And so there's silence in the room and we ask for questions and a hand goes up and and someone asks, would you show this to your kids? And there was a problem there because of the five people up on the panel, Jonathan Frakes and I, our wives were uh, both uh, pregnant with, their, with our first kids, but we didn't have kids yet actually in a, to show cartoons to. Um, and, you know, Ed Asner's older, and my boss was older, their kids were older, you know, my boss's kids were in their uh, late teens, I think, at that time, and Ed Asner's son, Matt, is my age, you know, um, and so it's the question of sort of went down to Bill Fagerbach, who's the only one who had, you know, actual kid kids um, at that time, and Bill answered rather famously, now the Gargoyles fans, he answered, well, it's better than Barney. Um, <laughs> and what you got at that moment from all those reporters, that is particularly the ones who were parents, who had had to sit through hour after hour of watching Barney with their kids and, and wanting to slit their throat, frankly, which, <laughs> you know, within a few years I completely understood. Um, you got this huge release of laughter and tension. And literally, from that moment on, the press was always on our side. Um, when the show came out, we had a big premiere event down at Walt Disney World. The press came to that, and they loved it. We showed them a sort of cut-down movie version of our first five-episode pilot. Um, and uh, they loved it. We got only good reviews. Um, we were waiting for all these negative letters to hit us from parents groups, we got one. I mean, think about just that. one. One. Wow. <laughs> and it was clear from the letter that they hadn't seen the show. <laughs> that, in other words, they'd seen some advertising material and decided that Goliath was supposed to be Satan <laughs> and um, objected to the show, but hadn't actually watched it. And we didn't even ever hear back from that person. So either they just decided never to watch it, or they watched it and said, oh, well, this isn't a problem. Um, and we only ever got, uh, you know, I don't want to say that every uh, review that came out was 100% uh, positive. You know, we got some mixed reviews in there. We got, didn't get any negative reviews. We certainly didn't get any reviews saying kids should not be watching this. Um, uh, you know, and... The press was just pretty much always on our side. They liked the show, and and that was it. You know, and it was different for Disney, and it was scary for a lot of people at Disney. And there were even some people at Disney who were like, "I don't think we should be doing this." But at the end of the day, it was never a problem. And it seemed to open a lot of doors for Disney and that type of animation because the '90s shifted a lot from the more cutesy stuff to by the end we had a lot more action oriented, a lot more darker stuff and shows like Gargoyles and Batman animated series and stuff like that really pushed things. Well, Batman really, you know, I, I want to give all credit to Batman. Um, 
you know, you mentioned Bruce Tim early on and Alan Burnett who did Batman with him and uh, and we stole a bunch of Batman people to do Gargoyles. If Batman the Animated Series hadn't existed, Gargoyles would never have gotten on the air. Um, and that's just a fact because we had those conversations. And there were times when if Batman's ratings went down, people at Disney would go, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. And if then Batman's ratings went up, they'd go, yeah, yeah, we should be doing this. <laughs> It was the mere fact that Warner Brothers was doing Batman that, in essence, gave Disney, as a company, the courage to go for it. I'm not saying we then copied Batman. I'm just saying that if that show hadn't existed, our show wouldn't have gotten on the air. And that's just true. You know, so I owe Alan Burnett, Bruce Tim, those guys a great debt. And again, we stole some of the people, like Michael Reeves, <laughs> who was our first story editor, our head writer, was a Batman story editor. Frank Parr, who was my partner on Gargoyles producing the show, he was a Batman director. And there were a number of other people who also worked on Batman the Animated Series who came over to do Gargoyles um, and lend us their talents for a time. Um, and I was a huge fan of Batman the Animated Series. So that really... You know, they came first. They really blazed the trail. I also think Gargoyles was sort of a unique animal in that, you know, it was an original property. Batman still had, even then, you know, what, 50 years of Batman tradition to base its fandom on. We had yeah. Zero. You know, we had nothing. We had to start from scratch. And so to the degree that we succeeded... Um, that was the great people who worked on the show from the voice cast on, um, you know, everybody there. That was all these talents coming together and creating something special um, because we had to start from scratch. But again, no way that show ever gets on the air if Batman hadn't blazed that trail. I do object often, so I'll do it again here, to people who call Gargoyles dark. I don't think it is dark. Um, I get that it's darker than something like Goof Troop, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I don't actually think Gargoyles is dark. I mean, certainly from a color palette standpoint, it's not dark at all. Um, it's rich. It's got magentas and purples and blues. It's set at night. But if you compare, for example, the night of Gotham in Batman, the animated series with its black and brown and uh, backgrounds, versus ours, our show is way more colorful. And that's not a, a qualitative judgment. That's a, an objective fact. They made a decision about the color palette for Batman the Animated Series. We made a different decision for the color palette for Gargoyles because from our point of view, night was where the Gargoyles were alive. You know, they slept as stone during the day. So at night, they're alive. So they don't view the world, their world, their nighttime world as a world of darkness, they viewed it as a rich world of color. It's just that the shades and hues are, are uh, the shades and hues of nighttime. But it was nighttime in Manhattan, so there was always a lot of light. Um, and that's just an example. You know, I, I don't think the show's as dark as people seem to vaguely recall it as. And I think if you watch it, it's not as dark as you remember. Um, and I don't just mean in terms of color. I mean in terms of tone. There's a lot of humor in Gargoyles. There's a lot of romance in Gargoyles. There's a lot of a lot of things in Gargoyles. And there's very little, surprisingly little, although there is some, of the kind of dark violence um, that one would label the show that way. And it exists, but a lot of it's implied as opposed to shown. For example, yeah. you have memory of characters being killed in that first episode who you'd met. And the truth is, that's just not there. If you watch that episode again, it doesn't exist. Um, and yet you have a memory of it. Maybe uh, it's that the overactive imagination of some of his fans that just... Well, that's the thing. I mean, in other words, we definitely implied stuff that we didn't show. And I don't want to say that we didn't mean it. Like, you know, there's no doubt that a bunch of gargoyles were massacred that night. But we didn't show any of them. We showed the end result of a bunch of pieces of stone laying about. And there's definitely the feeling, looking back in hindsight, that all these characters we knew and loved were killed. 
But the truth is you hadn't met anyone. Everyone who you got introduced to prior to that moment survived. Were not massacred. Every single one. You met Demona. She wasn't massacred. You met Goliath and Hudson. They weren't massacred. You met the trio of young gargoyles and the gargoyle beast, Bronx. None of them were massacred. Um, everyone that you actually met survives. Every single one. And none of it was shown on camera. So we're going to get to a couple of fan questions. Um, this listener wants to know, you've done a lot of different roles with animation, animated series, or at least different credits, of, you know, supervising uh, producers, executive producers, writers, and so on. And they just want to know, they've heard different things as far as when it comes to an animated show. Who actually has the most power when it comes to creating it? Does the director actually have it? Does the writers, producers, who actually controls each episode when it comes to the credits of an animated show? Well, every series is different, um, literally. Um, generally speaking, the, the producer title, there are a lot of variations. So, for example, on the first season of Gargoyles, I was co-producer for five episodes and then producer for the rest. And then the second season, I was producer and then got to push up to supervising producer on which I was supervisory producer on uh, – Spectacular Spider-Man, I, I think I was supervising producer on uh, Star Wars Rebels. I was executive producer on Young Justice. I was pr just producer. Every single one of those variations on titles was the exact same job. And basically, that's the job of a showrunner. And usually on a show that, uh, a show that I've produced, uh, I have a partner because I can't draw. I can't draw stick figures well. Um, so usually, uh, uh, almost always, or frankly always, I have a producing partner. So for example, on Gargoyles, that was Frank Parr. On Spectacular Spider-Man, that was Victor Cook. On Young Justice, that was Brandon Vietti. Um, and we are full partners. Now, what that means is that there are certain things that I have uh, primacy over. Usually that's the writing and the voice acting. And certain things that my partner has primacy over, usually the design and direction of the show, um, and then things that we do together, um, like post-production. Um, and different partners, the thing adjusts a little bit, but in any case, at the end of the day, when you see an episode of Young Justice, that is a Brandon Vietti, Greg Wiseman production. If you see an episode of Gargoyles, that's a Frank Parr, Greg Wiseman production. If you see an episode of Spectacular Spider-Man, that's a Victor Cook, Greg Wiseman production. Um, and, you know, those guys have also produced other things with other partners and other people. Um, but those specific things, it's usually we're the two who have final say. Now, that's final say up to a point. You know, there's still a network and or a studio uh, who, frankly, are paying the bill, so they ultimately get to you know, if nothing else, veto power. You know, they, someone might say, no, you can't use that character, or no, you can't do that scene, uh, or whatever, you know. Um, but, you know, they're not making the show, so I do think that the, you know, it goes to the showrunners. And and like I said, on, on those kind of shows, I've been a showrunner, which is not a title you see on screen. But Brandon and I were the showrunners of Young Justice. Yeah, technically, we were producers. Frank Parr and I were the showrunners of Gargoyles, though the on-screen credit was supervising producer. Um, and on the first season of Star Wars Rebels, for example, Dave Filoni, Simon Kinberg, and I were executive producers. Uh, that was the title, but in essence, the three of us were the showrunners. And so the different titles don't matter so much. It, what matters is who's the showrunner on these shows. And in that case, that was me. Now, I've done other shows, of course, where I was not the showrunner. I may have just been a story editor working for another showrunner. I may have just been a freelance writer, you know, hired to come in and write two or three episodes or something like that. Um, and I've also voice directed and I've voice acted and a handful of other small credits here and there. But, um, you know, every everything is sort of show by show. But for any television show, 
what you're looking for from the standpoint of who makes those final decisions. You're looking for the showrunner, keeping in mind that even a showrunner has network executives, et cetera, that they have to answer to. Okay. Um, so this next one is one that's gotten a lot of interest of late, and I know you shared a lot of stuff about it. They just want to know how – Serious? Should they take the rumors or stuff circulating about Netflix considering Young Justice to bring it back for a third season? How how serious is this? Well, you know? it, it's it's difficult to answer the question when it's phrased that way. Um, here's what here's the facts. The facts are that um, Young Justice went off the air because it wasn't financially viable. Our ratings were good. We were a hit. But in baseball terminology, we were a single. We weren't a home run, let alone a grand slam home run, from the standpoint of ratings. And what that meant is the ratings weren't so good that the advertising revenue coming in for the show was so great that it could pay for the show. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So given that fact, what paid for the show was money from Mattel who had the toy license, and the toy line failed. Now, we could talk for hours about why it failed and whose fault that is and all that stuff, try to place blame, and I'm not interested in that. At the end of the day, the toy line failed. For whatever reason, it failed. And that's where the money came from to pay for the show. And that is the simple, clean reason why we didn't get a third season. There was no money to pay for a third season. Now, a few years passed, and the world has changed a little bit. The rise of Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, etc., and the fact that they, A, produce original programming, or at least finance it, and B, are interested in reviving old shows that have an intense fan base creates an interesting opportunity for us. So what happened on February 1st of this year is that up to this point, Netflix had season one of Young Justice domestically in the United States. What changed on February 1st is that they put season two up. That created an opportunity. Suddenly they had both seasons up. And so I started this, I'm not denying it. I got on Twitter. And I said, guys, if you seriously, you know, because I have all these fans of Young Justice who tweeted me, usually they're saying, why did you cancel Young Justice? As if, like, <laughs> I did that. Like, I wanted to put myself out of work. Um, or they say, why don't you bring Young Justice back? As if I can control it somehow, a show that I don't own for a company that I no longer work for. <laughs> <You know? laughs> uh, and I have to answer that it's not up to me. It wasn't up to me to cancel. It's not up to me to bring it back, but it is up to the fans. And the reason it's up to the fans is that they can demonstrate that the show is financially viable because that's why it went off the air. So if suddenly it becomes viable again, that's why it would go back on the air. And there are three really clear, straightforward ways to do this. The first way is to binge watch seasons one and two of Young Justice on Netflix over and over and over again. This has two effects. One, it puts money in Netflix pockets. It, if the show trends on Netflix over and over again, which it has, although not consistently, despite all the tweeting, um, if it but if that happens, Netflix takes a look at it and goes, hey, there are a lot of people who want this show. Maybe we should talk to Warner Brothers about making more. Um, because it's money in their pockets. It's money in Warner Brothers' pockets, and it's money in Netflix pockets. And money is what gets their attention. A second way is to buy the DVDs or Blu-rays, because again, that puts money in Warner Brothers' pockets. They see all these Blu-ray purchases or DVD purchases and they go, wow, there's a big fan base for this. We could sell more Blu-rays and DVDs. Maybe we should make some more. 
The third way is to buy, we did a set of companion comics in continuity, written by me and Kevin Hobbs and, and a couple other guys, but in continuity with the show, time stamps just like the show had, so you can see exactly how it fits in. We did about 26 issues. They're all available on Comixology as e-comics. You buy them there, and that puts money in DC Comics' pocket. And DC Comics and Warner Brothers are both owned by Time Warner, but they're two separate divisions. And DC owns the characters, Warner Brothers owns the show. So you want both DC and Warner Brothers to get money in their pockets so that they are both sitting there going, gee, maybe we should be doing more with Young Justice. Now, when someone says to me, how serious should we take it? My response is, you should take it very seriously if you want the show back. If you don't care if it comes back, then, you know, it's not your problem. <laughs> but if you're one of these fans who are desperate to see a third season of Young Justice, and believe me, Brandon Vietti and I are desperate to make a third season of Young Justice, which is why we've been tweeting about it a lot. This is a real way to do it. People write me and say, should we start a petition? And I'm like, yeah, if you feel like it, but I don't care. Petitions are nice, but that does nothing. Because it do a petition doesn't put money in anyone's pocket. But you binge watch on, if you have Netflix already, so you don't even have to outlay any money. If you've got Netflix and you binge watch the show on Netflix, hell, you can turn it on and leave the room for all I care. <laughs> I, mean, I hope you like I the show and want to watch it, but the point is is that if, if every time, and you can do it over and over and over again, cha-ching, 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 money in pockets, that gets attention. If you don't have Netflix, buy the Blu-rays. If you've already seen the show a bunch of times but haven't read the comics yet, buy the e-comics on Comixology. And the reason I emphasize that is because the actual physical copies of the comics, which are precious to me, I'm an old fart, so, you know, e-comics don't mean as much to me as actually holding the book in my hand. But the fact is, is those books are all out of print. So if you go to a comic book store and, and buy the hard copies, that's great. I love that because I appreciate that, and I appreciate a good comic book store that has those back issues. But the thing is, that means that's a resale. That's not a sale. That's a resale. DC Comics doesn't see a dime from a resale. But if you go to Comixology and buy the e-comic version for your iPad or your Kindle or whatever, your phone, DC Comics sees dollars. That gets their attention. And that's what we want to do is get their attention. And, by the way, we seem to have gotten their attention. Now, does that mean it'll happen? I can't answer that question. People are writing me now, hey, I've been binging YJ. Does that mean it's happening? <laughs> like, I don't know. It's not happening yet. Some don't guy wrote, tweeted yesterday that, oh, it's happening. They just can't announce it yet. I'm like, you're just wrong. Because if it were happening, I would know. And I wouldn't be breaking my butt telling people to, to hashtag keep binging YJ. By the way, that's the important hashtag. You get a lot of people who are hashtagging, hashtagging Renew Young Justice, which is, again, like a petition, and it's a perfectly lovely hashtag. But it does nothing. It's the fans talking to each other. We want to talk to the companies. And the way to talk to the companies is to hashtag keep binging YJ because that is a call to action. You emphasize that hashtag, people binge the show, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And I wish it didn't come down to money that way. Wouldn't life be lovely, unrealistic, but lovely, if it weren't about money? But it is absolutely 100% about money. <laughs> if we good. want the yeah. show, and by the way, it took money to make the show all these people love. It's not like it got made in some magical kingdom. It got made in Burbank, California, because a lot of people got paid a decent wage to make the show. And it required materials like paper and pencils and index cards and computer terminals and stuff like that. It costs a lot of money to make a television series. And so if people want season three, this is a real way for it to happen. And the thing that makes me nervous is now 
people are like, okay, I did it. I binged it. We're done. Where's my show? It's like, hey, no one said we're done. This is an ongoing thing. This has to keep happening until or unless people decide, A, nah, I don't want a third season, or Netflix and Warner Brothers or whoever, I mean, whoever and Warner Brothers says, we're making it. And believe me, when that announcement comes, I'll shout it to the rooftops. To a great one. big applause. <laughs> yeah. But it hasn't happened yet. So all these people and they're, you know, who are going, oh, they wouldn't be talking about this if they weren't already making it. That's ridiculous. Yes. If we were already making it, I wouldn't need to talk about it. <laughs> See, you know? You'd be busy making it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it isn't happening. But I do honestly feel it could. I really do. And I definitely feel that this is the best chance we've had since the show went off the air. Again, there have been many petitions for this show, and I, it warms my heart every time I hear about one. But they, they do nothing. This is a way to actually effectively do something. But it's got to keep happening. Amen to that. So um, let's see. We're going to move on to uh, Spectacular Spider-Man because that's probably my favorite ever version of a Spider-Man show that's happened. There's been a lot, but in one of them, I believe your co-creator of Young Justice worked on um, the MTV one, New Adventures of Spider-Man, I think it's called. But uh, Spectacular Spider-Man, what I, I just want to know, you guys captured Black Cat, my favorite Spider-Man vill- uh, anti-hero, I guess, in, the best that I've ever seen done in any sort of show or video game. And I just wanted to know, I know the reasons why the show ended. You've posted it on your website. You've answered questions. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's legal stuff. Um, was there any plans or any ideas of continuing Black Cat's story? Because honestly, no one's captured her the way you guys have. No one's captured how awesome, as you've put it, she is. And it would have been a shame if there had been no plan to continue after that great uh, prison breakout episode that you had near the very end of the show's run. Yeah, of course we have a plan. She is one that most people ignore a lot in Spider-Man, but she's like Catwoman. She's very compelling in her own way and a, a great foil for Peter Parker, and most people just don't use her very much. Well, I don't know if I agree with that assessment. I think people use her a lot. I don't know if they always use her well, but um, but I, you know, I think a lot of people like Black Cat, and, and she's been used more than once, uh, and she continues to be used in the comics. She's in the comics now. Um, yeah. and, uh, I, I'm very proud of our black cat. I think Sean Galloway did a fantastic design on her. I think, uh, Trisha Helper, uh, does amazing voice work as black cat. I think she's captures that sort of sexy thing that we were doing a younger black cat, a black cat who's about 19, give or take. Um, and she captures that sort of young, uh, sexiness without being too overt and yet she's got some very wondrous double entendres in there. Our writers did a really <laughs> good job with that. Um, the key there being that they're double entendres. They're not single entendres. Um, <laughs> you know, people ask me, how'd you get away with that? I'm like, because they're a double entendre. And they're like, we tried to do this line. And I'm like, well, no wonder you couldn't get away with that. There's no other interpretation of that except the dirty version. You know? <laughs> um, so, of course, you couldn't get away with it. But we, you know, there was always – a a way for a younger kid to understand the line without it having any sexual implication to it so that it allowed us to get away with a couple things that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to. Um, and that was fun with that character specifically. Um, and again, I, I can't give enough credit to Trisha Helper, who was just amazing in that role. Uh, and Jane Thomason, who directed her in it, and and all sorts of people, um, particularly the writers and Sean Galloway, uh, who designed the, her look, or, you know. And, uh, but, you know, she's just a hugely fun character. Okay, and so we have again, one more you know, Obviously, we wouldn't have set up at the end of the episode opening night that she may have been dead against Spider-Man if we didn't plan to play that out. So we did. Awesome. Awesome. So we have uh, one more listener question I think we have time for. is um, They just want to know about uh, Reign of the Ghost. They said they, they love your book, Reign of the Ghost, and love that the second book you know came out and the third one's happening. But 
They say you're currently working on a an audio play of Reign of the Ghost. They just want to know where that's at and what we can expect from it. Uh, it's done. They can get it now. Um, oh. Go to gumroad, G-U-M-R-O-A-D dot com slash rain, R-A-I-N of the ghost, plural. So gumroad dot com slash rain of the ghost. You can purchase and download it now. Um, I think uh, eventually it will be on more sites for purchase besides Gumroad, but it probably won't be, it'll probably, this, it's probably cheapest now. Um, this is a four hour full cast production. It's an unabridged version of my novel, Reign of the Ghosts, um, with a cast of 20 actors playing 30 roles, a full musical score by Dynamic Music Partners. These are the composers who did Young Justice, Attack of Spider-Man, um, Avengers, multiple great shows. And there's, it's nearly four hours of original music by them, full sound effects. It's basically an animated movie, except the pictures are in your head. Um, full cast, amazing actors in it, Ed Asner, from all the shows we've talked about, Ed Asner, uh, uh, Maria Sirtis, uh, Brent Spiner, um, Steve Bloom, who plays uh, Zeb on Star Wars Rebels, uh, Vanessa Marshall, who plays Hair on Star Wars Rebels, who played Black Canary on Young Justice, and Mary Jane Watson on uh, Spectacular Spider-Man. Um, Eric Lopez, who played Blue Beetle in Young Justice. Uh, Brighton James, who played uh, Virgil uh, Hawkins, Static, in Young Justice. Um, Josh Keaton, who played the Spectacular Spider-Man himself, Peter Parker. Uh, and uh, and I'm blanking out, but, you know, just uh, 20 actors, every single one of them terrific. Um, and this is a great four-hour production. Um, and uh, it's on Dumb Road now, and I really hope people listen to it. I, I know I'm biased, but I truly feel so many great people uh, involved in this that I can say with some objectivity that it really turned out fantastic. I couldn't be happier with it, and uh, I really hope people check it out. Meanwhile, you can also get the books themselves, Reign of the Ghosts, and the second book in the series, Spirits of Ash and Foam. You can get them on Amazon. You can go to a bookstore. If they're not literally on the shelf the day you happen to walk in, you can go to the front desk and order them at any bookstore. Um, and... Uh, I'm very proud of these novels. They're, if you like Gargoyles, if you like Young Justice, if you like Spider-Man, Witch, Rebels, any of my shows, I really do think you'll like uh, these novels. Um, they're rich in mythology uh, and character and incident, very tightly, densely plotted. I, you know, I, I'm very proud of them. Fantastic, and I I I'm a fan of audio of audio plays in general, and I'll be I have that site pulled up right now, and once I make sure I have enough money, I will do the do the payment. Um, so uh, the last question, which we have for everyone, and we have a slight request afterward. Um, last question we have for everyone is to promote what you're working on now. Um, any you know, a lot of our guests have appearances and. Comic cons, especially summers, are tend to be really busy for everyone. Um, projects that are coming out and so on. And I know you're working, or have been working on uh, the the Canaan stuff. Um, what are you working on now? What do you have coming up? What do you have uh, that you can promote to the fans that you're actually, of course, allowed to talk about? Uh, there are a couple comics I have with Marvel. Uh, one is Star Wars Canaan, um, which is sort of uh, features the Canaan character, King Jarrus from Star Wars Rebels in his own series. The last issue literally came out yesterday, issue 12. Uh, the first six issues are already collected in a trade, um, but I think you could go to comic book stores and get um, uh, Star Wars Canaan, and certainly you can get them with the Marvel app or a Comixology, uh, get the e-versions of them, and they really look gorgeous, I have to say, as e-comics. Um, I think they look pretty great um, otherwise. Uh, most of the series was drawn by uh, Pepe Lara's. Pepe's art is so fantastic, I think I could have written a shopping list for a script and it would still be a terrific book. <laughs> I hope I did better than that, but, but Pepe's art is just gorgeous. Um, and the last issue was uh, 
uh, we ended with issue 12, and issue 12 came out literally yesterday. And then the other book I'm doing for Marvel is a superhero title called Starbrand and Night Mask. Issue four of that um, book uh, also came out yesterday, literally. And, and by yesterday, since I know this won't air today, um, I mean it came out uh, March 16th. Both those books, uh, Canaan 12 and Starbrand and Night Mask 4, came out March 16th and are available now. Um, I'm very proud of the Star Brand and Night Mask series as well. It's, it's a great, diverse series with a, a fun cast of characters. It's about two cosmically powered characters who are trying to start their freshman year of college while fighting big cosmic level bad guys. Um, and uh, I think it's a lot of fun. The artist on that book is Domo Stanton. He's terrific. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled with how that book's turning out as well. I'm working on issue six of that book now, uh, while uh, issue four just hit the stand. Um, in terms of appearances, um, I have a bunch of conventions coming up. I think the, the closest one uh, is WonderCon on uh, March 27th. I'm doing a panel, uh, Justice League, the title of the panel is Justice League versus Young Justice. I don't know what that means. But I do know that uh, on the panels myself, my producing partner, Brandon Vietti, uh, and three great voice actors, Cardi Payton, who played Aqualad and Black Manta in Young Justice, is probably even better known as Cyborg on Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go. Um, and then the original great voice of Batman, Kevin Conroy, um, from Justice League, and Susan Eisenberg, the uh, original voice of Wonder Woman from... Uh, Justice League and Justice League Unlimited uh, will also be on the panel. And so that should be a lot of fun on Sunday the 27th in Los Angeles. And then my next convention after that, I believe, is the Midwest Media Expo in uh, Michigan, uh, which is uh, April 14th through 17th. Um, and I'll be appearing there. And of course, people can follow you on your website. You still have a lot of relevant information on your Ask. Well, the Gargoyles website where you, people can ask you questions about your stuff, um, is that still fully active? Like, people can still send you questions? They can, although I, I'll admit I'm a year behind answering questions because I just got flooded with so many, and I answer, you know, two or three a day kind of thing. And, and so when I can only answer two or three a day and 20 or 30 a day come in, it means I've fallen behind. Um, but I do get to them all eventually. Um, but what's really valuable there, if you go to the website, it's AskGregWeisman.com. Um, my name is spelled G-R-E-G-W-E-I-S-M-A-N. So it's Ask, A-S-K, Greg Weisman, all one word, dot com. Um, there's this huge archive, because I've been answering questions there for 16, 17 years. So the odds are, and it's a searchable archive, the odds are that I've probably already answered your question, whether it's about Young Justice or Spider-Man or uh, Gargoyles or whatever. Odds are good I've answered it already. So you can search that archive um, and find the answer without waiting for me to answer the question. Um, and in fact, if you post the question and I read the question and I'm like, dude, I've answered this already, I'll just refer you to the archive anyway, so you might as well check it first. Um, and, uh, so there's a ton of questions there. You can also reach me on Twitter. Uh, I am, my, uh, Twitter handle is at Greg underscore Weissman. And if you've got a short question, one I can answer in a single tweet, I'm happy to do that on Twitter. I check Twitter pretty much every other day these days, um, uh, for a couple hours at night. Um, and uh, happy to answer short questions there. But again, if you've got a question that would take me paragraphs to answer, Twitter's not a good format for that. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I have two pages. Uh, one's a you know, personal page and one's a professional page. And honestly, Facebook mystifies me. I don't understand it. I can't tell which page is which. I don't know how to do it. So um, you can friend or follow me there which is great and lovely, but again, I, it's not a great form for me to respond to fans because it, it's too complicated for me. I'm, I'm too much of a, a dope to understand Facebook <laughs> and how it works. 
Um, so uh, you're better off trying to reach me on Twitter um, or, again, going to AskGregWeisman.com. Thank you.